Our next speaker is from Louisiana, Dr. Allen, and he has a good talk for us about sedges and rushes, something I've always had immense difficulty with, so I'm excited about this one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's it's going to be unusual effect. I think uh, we'll be the only person from Louisiana to speak, and also I don't think I'll be any overlap with any earlier speakers because I haven't seen anything on grasses or, or sedges. It's all been the pretty flowering plants. So, uh, so let's see if this works. There we go. So the two families are the grass family, the Poaceae, and of course the Sopraceae, the sedge family. Now there are also other plants that are considered graminoids, uh, mo the most common one, I guess, are the rushes, the Juncaceae. There are also other plants that would look like grasses if they weren't in flower, like yellow-eyed grass. There are several other kinds of uh, monocots and even a few dicots. There's a grass leaf golden aster. So there are a number of plants that if you're not in flower, you might mistake them for a graminoid. So I usually start out with the stem differences and the shape on sedges is mostly triangular. The shape on the grasses round or flat. Of course, there are some, there are some sedges that lose that triangular shape. They're more rounded, particularly I think of the, the spike rushes, the genus Eleocris, it's more round than it is triangular, but generally we say triangular versus the round. Uh, the nodes on the sedges are very inconspicuous. The nodes usually on grasses are very conspicuous. I'll show you some pictures in just a moment of that. And then uh, a very important characteristic is that the, the inner node, the space between the nodes in the sedges is filled or solid, whereas uh, the uh, space between the nodes, the inner node in grasses is usually hollow. And here's a triangular stem of a sedge. And the conspicuous node on the, the grass. Not, not all are as large as this, not all are as, as conspicuous as this. And the, then the hollow versus the solid inner node. So pictures like that are the, the classic examples. Leaf differences, the leaves on uh, sedges are three ranked. I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. On grasses, they're two ranked, and the sheath, which is the, the base, you don't. Some people don't realize that that there's no petiole in grasses like petioles in the hardwoods, uh, most of the dicots. But the sheath is the, uh, is wrapped around the stem, and in the case of the sedges, the backside is is sealed or closed, whereas in grasses, the backside is open. One other something that I noticed pretty regularly looking for it, if you look at the top of a sedge leaf, you'll see a channel down the middle of it. So it's a channel one and the grasses don't have that. They may have a midrib that looks channel, but if you look carefully, you'll see that there's not a real channel there. So I get some pictures. This is a three ranked sedge and here's a two ranked grass. So again, often you really can't see this because it's hidden by the, the flowers or the spikelets on the top and things like that. But if you examine closely, you can see that two ranked and three ranked. And here's a, an illustration of the closed sheath on the left and an open sheath on the right. And here's that channeled leaf. So if you carefully look at the top of a sedge leaf, you'll see that channel down. You can also see that I should have gotten my fingernails cleaned before all <laughs> this. <laughs> the flower differences are kind of interesting. The perianth is, is of course, the sepals and petals, and grasses do not, and sedges do, do not have a perianth. I once heard somebody say that, you know, the flowers, the, the, these plants have flowers, but grasses do not have flowers. And I really wanted to slap them and say, look, <laughs> there are flowers, they're just not pretty. And it's, it's uh, the grass flower is something you would give somebody a bouquet of if you didn't like them. So that's, uh, <laughs> so anyway, the differences in 
Lodicules are little bumps that are supposedly in the grass. I've never seen one. I mean, I think you'd have to look very carefully. That's what the perianth has been reduced to. But in the case of sedges, it's been reduced down to bristles or scales. Uh, the stigma is uh, very plumose, very branched in the grasses, and in the sedges it's filiform. I will again have pictures in just a second of that. The anthers are very interesting in the, the, the versatile in grasses uh, and in the uh, uh, basophyx in the sedges. And then the fruit type, and these are again things that are really hard to see. So you're not really going to be able to, in most cases, examine just the fruit and be able to tell because these things are so small. But here's a really good picture that I found a few years ago to show you the, uh, the stigma and of the uh, stigma of the grasses up at the top and the bottom left is a stigma on the uh, sedges and you can see that really fuzzy, really plumose on the uh, grasses, but I wish they'd have done a little better job of making this more dramatic, there are differences between the two. But s most of the time we say that you really cannot uh, tell the difference between a sedge or a grass with their flower unless it's in fruit. But there one way you can, and that's to look at the anther. Look at the anther on the uh, grass up at the top and see how the, the uh, anther is attached in the middle. That's where that word versatile comes from. And then if you look down at the bottom left, look how it's attached at the end, basophic. So that's one easy way to tell a sedge from a grass when it's just in flower, not yet in fruit. And the fruits are, like I say, I guess you would really have to work hard to find, a, to be able to see them because they're small. But the, the fruit of a grass is a caryopsis, and a lot of people mislabel this. They call corn a, you know, a corn seed, but technically that's a fruit unless you have taken that outer covering off. And if you take that outer covering off, then you would have a seed. But in eating technology, what do we call that? It's, it's been called hominy. So hominy is a true seed of a grass. Whereas if you were just looking at the one with the yellow and the color and still on it, that's a fruit and a caryopsis. And the fruit of a, of a uh, sedge is an achene, a very, very small. Another achene is in the sunflower family, although some of the smarter botanists have now started to call it a cypsilia, something like that, but I still think achene, I'm old fashioned. So it's an achene and in a sunflower, it's a one seeded one, but it's attached to the ovary wall in only one place. That's the reason you can crack open a sunflower seed, get the seed out and eat it, and then throw the seeds on the ground to irritate the janitors on the floor. So that's a, that's a, that's a difference between an aching and a caryopsis and a difference between the sedge and the grass with regard to fruits. But of course, you, you know, again, it's so small, so hard to see. There is a saying that went around, sedges have edges, rushes around, which is an, the, the other one that we don't talk much about, but in order to have this poem, we have to say, sedges have edges, rushes around, grasses have joints when the cops aren't around. So, <laughs> but with the, the changes in laws, this may not be needed to be said anymore pretty soon, so <laughs> we won't have a rhyme to go with it anymore. But for grass identification, to do that first. First most, most important thing to remember is that, that grasses have spikelets. Now, I remember a few years ago going to a North American prairie conference and working with Haskell University Native American students, and together we, we gave a talk on switchgrass. And they heard the word spikelet when I was talking with them, and they'd never heard it before because they were, you know, not most of them were not majoring in biology, but they were just interested in their heritage. But uh, that night they went to a bar to a karaoke and they named themselves the Spikelets. <laughs> so, 
So anyway, the spikelet is made of a, a, an, an axis called a racilla, and along that racilla you can find the uh, florets and also at the bottom the glooms. And spikelets come in various numbers. The one on the left has many florets, the one on the far right has one floret, and the ones in the middle what has, has three. So you, the number of florets, the number of individual flowers varies from many down to one. So the ones are very hard to see with the naked eye. So when I start to teach anything about spikelets, I always use the one on the left to, to, to begin with. There's another thing that you need to look for, and that is how the spikelet is compressed. So you see whether it's compressed from the side, like the one on the left, and that's called lateral compression, or it's compressed from the back, and that would be dorsal. So this makes two major groups of spikelets when you look at them. Many of the ones that we see in the fall of the year have the dorsal. Many of the ones we see in the spring of the year. This is not 100%, but generally we think of the lateral ones, a lot of spring ones, the dorsal ones, a lot of fall ones. The gloom length, which is the base at the base, there are two of those, sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes none, but if the glooms can be shorter than the spikelet, which is a case of many, many, or it can be longer, and you can see the one on the left, the one on the right. So these are things you would look for in identification. But to me, the first thing I can see before I even start to look at the spikelet is the overall inflorescence. Now, I have a rule that I don't do windows and I don't do sterile grasses, so you stay away from those. But if you have the inflorescence, you can, start, you can get a head start on it because there are only five basic inflorescence types in grasses. And those can be seen with the naked eye and it makes it a starting point for you too. One type is the open panicle. As you see on the pictures here, the left and right, there are two different open panicles. Then if you take that panicle and contract it down, of course you get a contracted uh, panicle or a spike-like panicle. So one of these five would help you at the beginning to get it into the right category. So that's two of them. This one, the rames. When I first started in looking at grasses many, well, in 1970, how many years, 50? How many, I can't do the math, I'm not a, a math, uh, a daughter that teaches math, so I have to go to her for many of my math questions, but about 50 years ago when I started, the name of this was a racine, but my major professor said, it's not a racine, we need another name. Then they came up with spike-like panicle branches. Talk about filling in a, you know, right up for that. And then finally along came the word rame, R-A-M-E. It's almost like sliced bread in, in grass. <laughs> They're coming up with something like that. It was great, the rames. And the rames can be like this, which is digitate at the end of the stem, or they could be racemose. So, Think of these, that's, these are very, a lot of grasses have rames. And the first thing I want to know, is it a rain? And second, I want to know, is it digitate or is it uh, racemo? So that, that separates a lot. Now, the genus Paspalum, which is this one's up here, these two, is very important to me because I did that genus along with the guy from Florida for the North American flora. So you go back uh, many, it's been quite a number of years. So in the flora of North America, you'll see my, my treatment of Paspalum for the United States. And then the, the fifth one is a spike. And spikes are mainly early season ones. And a lot of those are from Europe, like wheat and barley and rye. We do have one native one, and that's this one the, on the right, I'm sorry, on, which is wild rye. But on the left, that's wheat. So spikes are not that uh, common. I think in a, lot of agro, in a lot of agricultural discussions, they often talk about seed head for grasses, and there are no heads that I know of. There may be one little small genus that has a head, but all the others are gonna either be the panicle, the open panicle, 
the contracted panicle, the rames either digitate, erase the most, and a very few have the spike type inflorescence. And that's something that you can look at, you can determine without a, a microscope or hand lens. So for grass identification, uh, more than 400 species in East Texas, more than 100 genera. And the largest genus is Dicanthelium. So if you want to be a, a, a really hardworking, uh, pulling out your hair, pick up, pick up Dicanthelium and start working with that. Now, the di Dicanthelium, I'll have some pictures in just a moment. So there are 37 species or varieties of that in East Texas, and these numbers might be 39 tomorrow, might be 35 tomorrow, when, depending on changes and so forth. The second most is that genus I just mentioned, Pasphalum, with 27 plus or minus, and then the Aerogrossus, the love grasses, with 21. So that's the big ones. And here are some big blue stem, one of my favorites. When I worked at Fort Polk, anytime I saw a clump of big blue stem, I would take a small clump of it and take it home. So I have in my house 25 to 30 different clumps growing and they've grown quite a bit. So a big selection of big blue stem at my house. Some are red, some are yellow, some are hairy, some are glabrous. I always remember that I told my students the way to remember the difference between glabrous and pubescent is to look at my head. The top of my head was glabrous, the side is pubescent. So <laughs> they would remember. So anyway, big blue stem is a, the one you can see right away and hopefully recognize that, look, there are rains there and they are digitate. So. And then one that I went on the field trip to the Caddo Mounds because I've actually participated with my wife Susan back there. We actually helped build a, a grass house out of switchgrass in Lawrence, Kansas at Haskell University. I forget what year it was, but it's been a while. But switchgrass is a very interesting one and you see the open panicle there. And by the way, I was reminded to tell you that out on the table we have some switchgrass that came from almost Eden plants in Louisiana and they, they do sell the switchgrass and you can order from them. And th there are some cultivars of switchgrass, the Alamo and others out there of switchgrass. But there are also quite a bit of switchgrass in uh, Texas, East Texas is West in Louisiana. And then little blue stem. I think it's the most common understory grass and maybe the plant in most of the pine forest in our area. Very, very common, extremely common, uh, that one. Now this one has rames and also, but notice the rames are racemos for that. And there is the genus that when I started, this was Andropogon, but then it got split into several or well, three genera and so this is little blue stem. Very, very common, very important plant of many parts of East Texas and, and even in Louisiana. Eastern gamma grass, one of the few grasses that are edible. I, I include this in my edible plant uh, weekend eatings. Uh, very hard to eat, but at one time it was considered perhaps to be an ancestor of corn, now they say it's not, it's somewhere in the uh, off, offshoot from corn. But anyway, I'm sure Native Americans crushed, ground this up and made flour out of it and people taste of it and you, on a good day, you can get a hint of corn from chewing these. They're very, very dry of the Eastern Gamma. Inland sea oats, uh, I think one of my favorite grasses, we still don't, uh, don't have a state grass of Louisiana. This is the one I would like to put up. I think there's a Bodaloa that's a, a state grass of Texas, but uh, this is one that I would really like to see. Really, I, th I also push it as a replacement for monkey grass because in the, in the winter it's still green, so it could be replaced monkey grass. And then you have the, the, the seeds that come out that are really an open, drooping panicle. And then purple top, which is a lot of that out right now, another open panicle of tridents. And like I said, when I pick these grasses, I pick mostly things that were tall, things that were big, and things that were in flower 
right now in the fall of the year. And I think I put all of this or most of this in the handout that should be available and there was a write-up that I got in in time. Indian grass, uh, with the, if you, I don't have a picture of it, but I, I should have brought, there is a, on the, where the sheath and blade come together, there's some little points that some people say look like arrowheads. So that may have been the origin of the name, but I think the origin of the name is the top it looks like a yellow feather. So I think that that's where the, the name, but I guess I should change that to native, um, native American grass. I think there've been some name changes in, in the common names there. Another, this one's kind of between an open panicle and a contracted panicle. And here's a rosette grass, a dicanthelium. Very small spiklets. And the, the way to recognize this is that there is a spring or vernal form, like on the left with an open panicle. And then in the fall of the year, the spikelets are produced in the axils of the leaves. So these two plants, the, the, the vernal and the fall, might have been recognized or as two different species earlier before people realize that, you know, the, the spring form becomes the fall form. And then one of my favorites is this one, which is very hairy, a lot taller. This is uh, another rosette grass, dicanthelium uh, scoparium. I often jokingly say this would make good toilet paper if it were just wider. So it's pretty small <laughs> leaves. <laughs> and then a little bit on the the sedges, the Sophraceae, there are only maybe 15 genera, less than, fewer than 15 genera of this family in East Texas, in Louisiana, maybe in the United States, but not like the 400, I mean, not like the 100, I'm sorry, of the ones in, in grasses, so just fewer, but getting it to genus is easy but often getting it to species is difficult. So you can, usually most people can recognize a, a genus of the sedges, but getting those to species. So the largest one is the genus Carex, and that's, it's probably 87, 88, or 79, whatever the number of species today, but those are very difficult, and so very good, difficult to get to species. Then the second largest one is the genus Sapirus, the third largest, Rhencospora, and you on, go on down the list, uh, Iliocris, but the genus Scirpus was recently divided into three or four different genera that you can see up there, Pembrisilis and a few others, and there are a couple of other genera that I didn't list that only have one or two species. Sedge, spikelets, and again, there's been argument over the years about what do you call a spikelet in the sedge family. So uh, some say again that it's, that it's uh, one individual floret of one individual flower with a bract. Others say it's that thing that you see over on the left, which is a, a group of those. So I usually think of the ones on the left as a spike and the ones on the right as a spikelet, but it, it doesn't matter. It's very different. It doesn't have limba, it doesn't have paleo, it doesn't have glooms, but it's a different situation in the sedge family. And the genus Carex, these are some characteristics of it. It's a perennial, there are no annuals, and some of the other uh, genera, they have annuals or perennials, but this is only perennials. You go down the list, uh, this, this information is available in the handout that, was the, the, that we put together before the, uh, that I emailed in before that. But the biggest thing is that last word, perigonium. All the car genus Carex, the aching and the ovary is surrounded by a sac-like structure called the perigonium. There's a good illustration over on the left and some pictures on the right. So it's in a, inside a sac-like structure. Now, of course, when they're large, that makes it easy. But some of these that are small, it's kind of hard to see. And at the very end, I'm going to say, you shouldn't ever start out with a, looking at grasses or sedges unless you have three hand lenses and two microscopes so, so <laughs> to begin working with these. So anyway, Carex is a very interesting one. There are a lot of early spring blooming 
Um, early spring ones. We're talking February, March, they're in flower, April in fruit. Uh, quite a number, and those are the ones that I have a lot of trouble with. So I just kind of put them in the genus and I hope to get the species right. There are keys out there for them. And I, at the end, I'm going to show you some books that, that, are, that are available on that. And let me back up for a second. Uh, this is one of the group that has triangular shaped uh, achenes inside. So triangular shaped achenes, quite a few, but it makes it easy because there's another group that has lentic lenticular shaped, flattened achenes inside. So they're groups with, which makes it easy because this is a smaller group. This one is a much smaller group than the ones with the triangular. So if you have the lenticular ones, it makes it easy. And then there are the large ones, which I really like. And th some of these I can actually identify without a microscope, without, pretty confidently, without a hand lens. And that's, this is in two methods, with the large ones or the groups there. And then there are other, there are quite a number. This is, I think there's been a name change here. It's no longer Frankie I, but something else. But this one actually grows right on my property. And it's not as wet a habitat as some of the others, but that one's pretty easy to recognize. But that's a spring one there, so sort of sort of spring. And then this is the one you find this time of the year, and this one's in the bagels, the bogs, and so forth. And it's bluish or grayish, so it's fairly easy to recognize. I also thought this is the one that would be the most cultivatable one because the, even the bottom of the plants are blue. So it's, it's rather, rather attractive and uh, it's there much of the year. Some of the spring ones, they're there for a short time and then they're gone, but this one's pretty much year round. And here's that genus, the Sapirus, and the key word is the last term, or the key term is the last one, scapos. And scapos means that the uh, leaves are only at the top of the plant or at the bottom of the plant. You don't have them in between. Yucca is a good scapose plant and uh, dandelion is a good scapose plant. And Sapirus is scapose. It has basal leaves and top leaves but no stem leaves. And the spikelets are flattened so it's called flat sedge. And there's, there's some round-headed ones, the obularis I knew for years, but it name got changed to crocea, so that one like that. And this is one, I hate to see it because I don't know which of three species it is. It's either strigosus, escalanthus, or odoratus, so you really have to tear into these to be able to tell these three apart. So people ask me, so I look at them and say it's one of the three when they, when they ask. Some people don't appreciate that answer, but uh, I would hand them a microscope. Pseudovergatus is one, I think, one cut available. There's another one very similar to this called Virens, uh, Pseudovergatus, with that shape of uh, spikelets at the top of the plant. And then this one with the, this is in dry land with the tapered down round look. So either Retrofloctus or Pluca So. Those are some sapphires. And then the, the worst weed, at one time this was, I think, considered one of the worst weeds. I think uh, uh, Kogan grass might have moved ahead of it in some parts of the world, but this one's pretty bad, that nut sedge. Uh, there's even special herbicides to kill it and so forth. So anyway, that one's out there. And then the genus Rhincosphere with at least 34 species. A lot of those, especially in the East Texas, especially in the pine lands of the, the bogs and so forth. And the last term down at the bottom is what I look for, dark brown spikelets. And there are some empty scales within the spikes to recognize uh, the genus Rhincospera. The biggest one that I'm, I always like to see this one, because corniculata I'm confident of. It's a big tall one, and if you're seeing corniculata, you're in a wetland. Uh, it's a wetland species, so people are doing that. And then there's just one of those many 33 other species <laughs> that, that are there, many of those together. And 
So what you have to do is tear into and look at the Akeen, and you can look at the bristles versus the Akeen, the roughness, the shape, the length of the bristles, lots of characters go into it. Thank goodness for line drawings. So you can look at the people have done these, put line drawings out there for you to, to see and to look at. But it's really, Rincosper identification requires the microscope or the hand lens. And this is one of the, Rin, used to be the genus Dichromina, now it's Rincospera, and it's more of a wildflower. Look at that, that's in the bogs, that's the white top sedge. In fact, in working with the photographer for my book on Louisiana wildflowers, we included this one, and he wanted to, because he'd already, on his own, he had taken pictures and thought it was a flower. But these are the bracts that are white. A couple of species, and there's a close-up of those. Those are, the, those are the reason some people go to the bogs, I think, more, to see, not to see the picture plant so much, but to see the, the white top sedges. And here is that genus, the Eleocharis, with 28 species. The, a couple of characters for identification. One, that the leaves don't have blades, so you won't be seeing blades out to the side. They're bladeless sheaths. And then there's one spike per stem at the type, hence the name spike rush for the common name for the, even though it's not a rush, but the spike at the end. And this is the most common one, I think, a smaller one, obtusa, Eleocris obtusa. I don't, some of these have had common names put on them, but a lot don't. And then a real small one, Parvula. And then the large ones, when you get down, especially toward the marsh and down toward the coast, you can pick up the Equisetoides and you can see the, the joints on it. It almost looks like an Equisetum. And then one that has a, a square stem. So quadrangulator, so there are, when I see the big ones, I'm happy, because I know I can get those identified, but when I see those little ones, it's, it's pretty tough. But the big ones, you can feel confident that you can get those to a species. And then the genus Scurpus, which at one time was a pretty good sized genus, but then like I say, it got split into four but there, and look at my comment at the last, variable. <laughs> so it is variable for the, for the different species within it. In fact, we start out with a very small one. This one's extremely small. It's only three to four inches tall, and it got moved to the genus Isolepus. It used to be a Scurpus cololepus, but now it's Isolepus cololepus. Then the several species like this that you often find in kind of in the clay soil, not as so much wet, but I, I see this one in, in the clay soil areas. These three, and the, the, again, you can get it to the, the, the group of three, but then you gotta tear into it to get to see which one of these three it is. And then my favorite one, Scurpus sapirinus, it's woolly grass, you know, though it's not a grass, but it's, a, I'm sorry, woolly sedge sometimes, woolly grass. And, but it's, it's very hairy. If you're looking at this, you're probably not far from that Rincosper corniculata that we had earlier. And you're gonna be in a pretty wet habitat with Scurpus sapirinus. Pretty recognizable and pretty tall So for the fall. And another one that I still kind of hold in my mind as being a favorite because when I was working on my PhD dissertation running all over Louisiana looking at grasses, there was a, another graduate student with me that was studying this one, so we would travel together and he would collect the scleria. He's now a medical doctor in Virginia. He forgot, gave up botany for more, more money-making uh, uh, career. But anyway, uh, look at the bottom. The, these are the ones with the white bony covering, so they're very, and he often said, if we could just get one of these large enough, then we, it would be a good ornamental but they're always so small with that white covering on the outside of the aching. So my, the pictures are not very good, hard to get those, but anyway, that, there's a white scleria. There are only eight or nine, seven, eight, nine species of scleria out there, and some are wet, some are dry uh, species of uh, scleria. And Farina, 
a very interesting one that should be called Cockerbur sedge because when you see the pictures of it, it really looks like a Cockerbur. And a lot of people don't know this. Often when I do my plant ID classes or graminoid classes and they see this for the first time, they never realize it was there and never realize that it was a sedge, but it's a funny looking one. See the, the cockerbur look on the left and the drawing on the uh, on the right. So, so anyway, Farina, well, just a few species. And as I said at the beginning, don't attempt to identify most grasses or sedges without hand lenses and or a dissecting microscope. Those are very, very important. And these are the books that you can use to identify the grasses and sedges in the area. The I, grasses of Louisiana, and this was, we were given an award in 2000, uh, 2008 when this meeting was going to be in Beaumont, ended up in Jasper. So we got the Carol Abbott Award for that book because it is very useful here in East Texas also. It's got, went all the way, and it was a, a very great honor that night to get that award for that one. And then uh, this is the guide to the Robert Shaw taught at Colorado State University and was the head of the, the, the so I worked for him and all of a sudden he came back to Texas, retired and did this book and I actually helped review it also. So that one's out there. Pretty big volume on the grasses of a uh, guide, uh, guide to Texas grasses. Then of course one that mentioned the, the illustrated floor with, with uh, Barney and other people that did the illustrated flora, and I'm looking forward to volumes two and three so I can have line drawings of all the other plants, but this one's also very useful, especially since I have the grass book, but the, very useful for sedges, which I, are not in the, the grass book, obviously. And then another one that I used quite a bit when I was teaching this class back in Monroe was Aquatic and Wetland Plants of the Southeastern United States by Godfrey and Wooten. Uh, monocotyledons. The, the title on the back of this book is exact, they didn't have enough room. So Wooten told me that when they got ready to print this book, so they had to figure out a way to tell the difference between the dacots and monocots. So on the back of the monocot, there's a one dot. And if you pick up, look at the back of it, you'll see it because they didn't have room to write out monocots. And on the back of the dacots are two dots. So it's a one dot, two dot, my students would start to say in class, that I need the one dot book or I need the two dot book for that. And then the flora of North America came out with all the grasses and the sedges have already been completed. What's great about this, it's online. You don't have to pay that 90 to $100 that I paid for each of these three myself. So I have a collection of all the ones that have come out and of course, the main reason for the grasses when I had three, two or three genera in there, but the big one was pastful. Then another smaller one, Coelorhynchus, and a couple of other small ones with one species in it. And so those are out and the sedge family's out. And I thought I had put one more, let's see, did I miss one? No, that's it. All right, so any questions? That, that's uh, re my recent trip to the Rio Grande Valley. And that's me in front of that Montezuma that I saw a picture earlier today. I forget who had it, but I could see the vegetation at the bottom that's no longer there in the front of it. They've mowed around that tree. And it's just across. To get to this tree, you've got to cross the wall now. You've got to go through the wall to get on the other side. So every year we go to the Rio Grande Valley, we go here and take a picture. It hasn't grown much in <laughs> the years we've been going. I'm sorry, Joe, you had a, Joe, you had a question? Uh, Oh, somebody else had a, yeah. Somebody, oh, uh, yes. Uh, you had mentioned that little blue stem is an understory? Yeah, it's a, it's a well, it's, you know, it's an understory herbaceous plant under the pine forest. Yeah, very, very common. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you are moving west, can, are they still, can they still be understory, or is it only in the piney woods? I, I don't know how far west they go. You know, the, but I think yeah, they're still in the Blackland prairies. Yeah, yes. yeah. So the, they would. I've seen them grow uh, in uh, sun, but not in the. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, they are. Yeah, I should have pointed that out. They're also in the Cajun prairie too, so they are 
full sun and also under the, the pine forest. But most of the pine forests, there, especially the longleaf, were very open anyway, so it was not, not as dense as the, the cultivated pine forests that we have so many today in the pine plantation. So there was more shade, more sun coming through in typical longleaf pine forests. Yeah. Somebody else had a, oh, yeah. And um, I don't know much about microscopes, but you mentioned dissecting microscopes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. I've always been disappointed with microscope makers for kids. They would make the compound microscope, which means that you had to make a slide and put it under. Most kids would give up and not do it. But if you had a dissecting microscope, which you basically just a magnifying glass with two eyes to look through, it's so much better. Kids would have used them a lot more because they could look at their fingers. They could look at big things. You just slide it on the microscope and look at it. And so that's what you really need. You don't need a compound microscope. You need a, that dissecting microscope. And it's got two, usually two, two eyes to look at. And it doesn't have that high magnification on it, not like a compound microscope. Yes, any, anyone else? Oh. Yes. Can you that yeah, uh, it's it's not a handout. Before, in fact, I was in South Texas, and there was a requirement that we get uh, if you wanted to have it. And there is something coming. It's probably going to be only online, but I think there's what what is it called for the somebody else? It's called for the whole program. The whole program this weekend. There is a a. Proceedings or something like that, yeah, that's out there. That's, I have a write-up very similar to what I just said on there, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Got to time-wise, I'm all right, huh?